Hi, we move into Genesis 31 today as Jacob gathers his wives after he finds out that Laban's face is not as favorable to him as it once was. So before we enter this passage, a couple of things to get us in our context. As you can see on the right side of the screen, we've been following the entire Jacob cycle around its three parts, beginning with Jacob and Esau around the birthright and blessing, ending with Jacob and Esau around the return in the center as we've been working through Jacob and Laban here. And now we're in this section here. And although we're starting at 31.1, I note that the really the, the frame of this following the structure we see here with this chiasm breaks this up as 31, 1 to 2 up here and 3 to 18. And today we're going to do 31, 1, maybe to 13 if we get that far. Uh, because what we're going to see here is there's a combination of the persuasion of Jacob getting his wives to leave their father and side with him, as well as Yahweh calling him to begin the return journey back to the place from which he began, which creates the chiasm that shapes this whole unit here. And as I've been noting uh, throughout this section, th since we started 28, 10, uh, there are a number of overlapping chiasms, as we'll see. This one that follows in 31.19 to 30 overlaps this one in 31.19 to 55. And if we wanted to, we could have continued on to Jacob's wrestling scene uh, that is parallel to the Bethel scene, etc. Because there's so much coming and going in the story that chiasms uh, seem to fit the overall structure of it. So we shouldn't be worried too much if these are not precise. So we'll begin with 31.1 and go through a big chunk of this here. Also in the background, we've been seeing how this whole story follows and yet inverses the wife-sister stories that we saw earlier in Genesis 12, 20, and 26. And we've been noting that recently in the last scene where the contrast between the patriarchs Abraham and Isaac getting wealth from the foreign kings and Jacob working for wealth that, as our scene today suggests, that God has taken away from Laban and given to him. Uh, and we've also been looking, and it'll be really important today, at how this entire section of Laban and his daughters can be read as an allegory of the monarchy and of exile. And I want to emphasize the monarchy and exile because as we're going to see here today in these parallels here, we won't quite get to this one, but we'll see in this one that Jacob inspired to return to the land of his ancestry both fits the, the exilic call, as we'll see from the Babylonian exiles from Judah to return, but also the Israelites to return uh, to the land of Israel, having left behind Solomon's son Rehoboam. And we see that in the following parallel here that we'll see in the next scene. So a number of ways in which the three levels of reading we've been looking at here apply all into this section. The immediate plot of Jacob trying to escape, in this case, not from his angry brother, but from Laban, the two nations in your womb as Jacob as Israel and remote from our immediate story, Esau as Edom. But I was also beginning to note last time, perhaps the two nations in Rebekah's womb also include Judah and Israel as the two nations that are formed around the monarchy in Jerusalem and then divide never to be reunited again. But also in the post-exilic period as a time to be called out of Babylon and uh, back to the land, uh, even though it's under Persian control, and that's another story you've been looking at as well. And so as we get to the return to the land, we'll get to that in just a moment, I want to note this is in the context of this whole sequence of divine recall calls to return to the land. The Hebrew word for return, shub, is used over a thousand times in the Hebrew Bible, and most of those for ordinary elements of turning around or turning things. And there are a number of times when characters call people to turn back. But I wanted to focus on divine calls to return to the land. There are many other calls to return to Yahweh, uh, which is in the sense of um, what the New Testament calls repentance or metanoia in the New Testament Greek. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the specific, as we hear in our immediate passage, return to the land. So we heard Yahweh say to Moses in Midian when he was in the a witness protection plan trying to stay away from Pharaoh, go back to Egypt. And then we hear in Leviticus the return that is Jubilee, to return to your own property uh, and hell of the 50th year. So that sense of Jubilee, which in Leviticus is both within the story world of um, the uh, trip into the promised land in the first place as well as in the exilic period. Uh, Deuteronomy similarly anticipating uh, exile here, but warning the king not to return to Egypt. So a negative one here, which is why I colored it pink. Um, at the near the very end of Deuteronomy, certainly anticipating the exile, uh, Yahweh your God will gather you and from there he will bring you back. 
Uh, it's certainly in what scholars have traditionally called Second Isaiah, quoted uh, in the New Testament Synoptic Gospels, right at the beginning, to prepare the way of Yahweh and make straight in the desert a highway to bring people back from Babylon. And similarly in Jeremiah, flee from Babylon, go out of the land of Chaldea, the Chaldeans, as we hear echoed symbolically in the very end of uh, the Christian Bible, if you will, in the book of Revelation, although it's certainly not a Christian text, but that's for my Revelation series here at Radical Bible as well. So as we've been looking at those things, we're also looking at the key words, and I've been noting last time the huge number of unique or rare key words in this section uh, indicated by the underlined words as well as the key words that are repeated here in bold, and the parallel between white and Laban, which is the same word in Hebrew that we saw last time, as the flocks gradually went from being Laban's to being Jacob's from being the white ones to being the colored ones, expressing an element of coming out of the foreign place and becoming one's own culture mixed with the other as well. And we see that throughout the history of the Israelites as they are affected by other empires and bring a little bit of them with them, the spots and the stripes, if you will, uh, before they return to their land. So we're going to be looking at, at this little section here. And as we note, um, it begins with uh, two perceptions from Jacob, uh, what he hears and what he saw, and we'll have to look at how mysterious that is, but then it, point, then it has a brief epiphany, and then Jacob calls the two uh, primary wives and makes an argument to them about why they should side with him rather than side with their father. And one can certainly note that this might be a similar argument to those inspired perhaps by the, the Isaiah passage or the Jeremiah passage to argue with their neighbors that they should leave Babylon and return to rebuild Jerusalem. So again, we can read this at all those levels. So no further ado, let's just jump in. So when Jacob heard, and how did he hear? As I was noting in the previous scene, much time has passed during uh, the breeding of the animals and Jacob getting such large flocks that the text can describe as exceedingly rich, not just the flocks, but with slaves, camels, and donkeys, uh, echoing what we heard about Abraham earlier, but not about Isaac, as we saw last time. So uh, there's been a great distance of time and a great distance of distance in the scene since the scene started with the word that Laban and his sons uh, moved three days' journey away from Jacob. Uh, with all their cattle while Jacob was uh, getting rich. And so whatever time has gone by, now Jacob has heard from somewhere that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's. He has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. Of course, that's one way to interpret it. And Jacob will interpret it differently to his uh, wives in just a moment. But that's certainly how they perceive it, that Jacob is a thief. Um, the word for wealth here is kabod or glory, and it's uh, first here in this context, although we'll see it uh, later in the Joseph story. Uh, and the claim of what belonged to our father is literally what our father made. But as we saw in the last thing, uh, in the last scene rather, Jacob made it, but Jacob will argue in this scene that it was actually God doing it all along. So Jacob heard that, and then he saw, and this is certainly not a literal seeing, but saw in the sense of had the insight, that Laban did not regard him as favorably as he did before, or more literally and more interestingly, Laban's face was not there with him as yesterday. And this is part of the face theme that we've been looking at throughout, and we'll see the face theme even more when Jacob prepares to reunite with his brother Esau and the wrestling event that we see. Uh, as my uh, note below has, here um, in, this long, uh, in this long quote, to work for someone is to make oneself vulnerable, dependent on approval for one's fundamental sense of self. Uh, citing but not quoting Rabbi Nauman, someone in this situation, quote, will find it very difficult to pray with the community. His face will lose its natural coloring, chameleon-like. He will respond to the imagined expectations of others. This is the challenge that Jacob faces in his relation to Laban. He must acquire strong hands, but not at the expense of his face. And so we get that nice insight into the story there. So, um, so with, that bef um, with that in mind that Jacob has heard what his sons are saying and he's seen that Laban's not on his side, then he has this experience. And one has to wonder, is the experience a function of his perceptions or is it just a coincidence the text doesn't give us cause and effect, only sequential correlations? We have to decide that for ourselves. As my note below has, this is the first live as opposed to dream experience of Yahweh by Jacob, as we saw in the Bethel nighttime scene and the earlier dream scene. And no context is given. We don't see where or when this is. It's just simply that it happened. And notice that in the saying, much like Abram, Yahweh saying to Abram in chapter 12 to go, the speaker is not identified. So as we saw in 12.1 when it said, Yahweh said to Abram, um, go. Now similarly, we don't hear the voice and Jacob has to decide who this voice is that speaks to him. And here's the key word, return. 
um, announcing the expected fulfillment of the vow that we saw in 2821, where Jacob, after the Bethel experience, said, if he will guide me back to the land. So return to the land here, El Eretz, here the land of your fathers and of your kindred here, um, which curiously in retrospect was Mesopotamia. So now it's this new land of Canaan, and I will be with you, recalling what we saw in 26.3 uh, to Isaac. So with that in mind, with the perceptions in mind and the epiphany in mind here, Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field. Um, as Jean saw notes below, unlike the previous demand to Laban to be released to return to Canaan, this scene proposes a permanent breach with the Mesopotamian branch of the family. Thus Jacob lays out the case and seeks his wife's consent. So he sent and called Rachel, and we might wonder for a moment, who is he sending? As far as we could tell, he's out by himself, although we don't know where he is until we see this scene, and we don't know if that's where he already was or if he's sending to meet him in this place. The meeting in the field recalls Cain and Abel back in 4.8, but certainly not with the same dire consequences, where his flock was. And we can read that flock two ways, as of course the animals, the colored and striped and spotted animals, but also his children who are not named here. And it's interesting given that Laban's daughters are here and Laban's sons are with him, uh, with his own flocks, but we don't hear where Jacob and Rachel and Leah's and Bilhah and Zilpah's children are, all 12 of them. And yet the flock is uh, parallel to that. So he says to them, and he says to them, I want to set out here this form of the argument that many scholars have noted among three divisions, what Jacob did, what Laban did, and what God or Yahweh did. So let's scroll down a little bit and we'll see how he makes a very nice argument here uh, for why their future is with him and not with their father and their old land. And keep in mind that he's asking a big thing of them, much like Abraham's servant was asking uh, Laban in the previous generation to send his sister Rebekah with a stranger to a land they've never known. Rachel and Leah um, certainly must know that Rebekah is there, although interestingly Jacob never n mentions Rebekah after the opening scene. Um, so they have to know that their aunt is there, um, and that would bring some sense of kind, some kind of family. Presumably, uh, she, Rebecca was alive when Rachel and Leah were alive, but we don't know that, and maybe that wasn't the case. But they was, certainly must know about Rebecca. So it's not quite as isolated as it would have been for Rebecca to go com with complete strangers, and yet Jacob doesn't mention that. He makes this argument instead. So he says to them, I see that your father did not regard me as favorably as he did before, echoing exactly what uh, we heard in his perception, his face was not with me. But he argues, the God of my father has been with me. Um, notice the God of my father first here, and we'll see it uh, several times, um, more in, two more times in Genesis, and then only one time in Exodus, only in those places. And notice, my father, not my father's, um, is it, does he mean Isaac or Abraham? We don't know. Um, and here, as with me, recalling an understanding as fulfilling the vow as we saw. So that's the first step of it. Then he continues here, um, opening uh, with the opening word, uh, tana, which is uh, to really bring attention there. You know that I've served your father with all my strength here. The Kel um, Koki here from the word Koka, only a couple other places in Genesis, although not as rare a word as many of the words we've seen, and not quite the same word as we see in Deuteronomy 6.5, uh, which is sometimes translated to lo love Yahweh your God with all your strength. Um, so that's what Jacob has done. He served a father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me. Um, using um, this word um, hithel only here in Genesis, but like Pharaoh in Exodus. So uh, Laban is being characterized as Pharaoh. And we can also note from my chart about divine calls to return, this all becomes a paradigm. It becomes Pharaoh is like the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon is like Laban, and they're all the same, which is exactly the idea that John of Patmos takes in mind in Revelation, in referring to the Roman Empire as being the same as Babylon, being the same as Sodom, etc. The same formation that Yahweh Elohim is calling the people of um, yeah, God's self out of is the same no matter what name it's under. That's the big picture of the biblical journey that I try to lay out in my book, Come Out My People. So your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. We've not seen that all narrated, um, but it's certainly been implied by the kind of argument we saw at the beginning of chapter 30 uh, when Laban kept offering to give uh, Jacob something to get him to continue to care for his sheep, but Jacob did not trust that he would actually give him anything. So this is narrating from Jacob's mind part of the story that we had not seen in, in narrated actually in the text. So we change it ten times, whether that's literally the case or a, a summary exaggeration, we can't say. Um, but God did not permit him to harm me, and that's the, the second line here. 
uh, under did not permit him, did not gi- literally did not give me, anticipating Joseph's speech there when he says that God did not allow uh, the brothers' behavior to harm Joseph as well. Um, to harm or, or literally to be evil here, as we saw back to the Sodom story. So, and he explains how that happens in this next part of the scene here. If he said, which is to say Laban, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. And if he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. What we had seen is that Jacob offered to take this, all the animals that were colored and striped, and Laban said, fine. And the moment that conversation was over, Laban went away and took all the speckled, striped, and spotted ones away, and then they were separate. So we don't see any interaction in the story as reported where Laban uh, continuously engaged in removing um, animals from the flock, but here's Jacob's narration. So we don't know if this is part of Jacob trying to deceive Rachel and Leah. Uh, Would they remember? Would they know about this? Is he simply reminding them of something they already experienced? Or is he making an argument based on something that he knows and they don't know? And the fact is, we don't know what the knowledge level of Rachel and Leah is in this situation. So then he continues to say what God has done. God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And notice that's a reinterpretation of what we saw where it was his trickery with the rods uh, and then with the the stronger and the weaker that allowed him to become rich. It was just a clever act on his part. But maybe he believed, as I was hinting, that knowing that in fact um, seeing white rods does not produce animals of a certain kind, that this was a method for letting God do that. But of course, we've never seen that God needs any kind of manipulation or symbolic suggestion to act. And so that would be unprecedented and there's really no basis for reaching that conclusion. But it is interesting question throughout the entire Bible of how much is God's and how much is human action. And maybe we can never really separate those. Um, The word in the Hiphal form Netzel here for taken away is first here in Genesis, and it's again in verse 16, and we see it a number of times, and it's 216 times in the Hebrew scripture, but often is rescue, and frequently part of the formula of God's taking away Israel from Egypt. And again, highlighting the point that this is meant to be a paradigm of coming out of a foreign land and returning. It's also in 2 Samuel 12, 7, as rescued in the interpretation of Nathan's parable, uh, and again, uh, parallel with the allegory interpretation of this whole story in relation to monarchy. Um, as Jean Son notes, as the connotation of rescue in times of trouble, thereby emphasizing in its next use in a few verses, the unfairness of their father's treatment of them and their children. So God has taken away the livestock, the mikna, which is the summary here, the generic term for the goats and the sheep together, and given them to me. Notice not to us, or not to you, but to me, because he's not clear whose side they're on yet. Um, So we'll continue here just through verse 13 so we can see his full argument. And I'll scroll down here so you can see the whole thing. So all he says here is, I had a dream, and the rest is on God. Um, Westerman, using the source form that he usually does, says these verses are preserved only in a corrupt form. Um, and Zakovich also suggests the dream is interpolated to address readers' unease with Jacob's actions, which is to suggest that giving it a divine imprimatur here uh, makes it sound better than if it was just deceptive. But it can also be read, as I've been suggesting, that the authors are, are trying to suggest both. They're not trying to protect Jacob from any charge of deception. Jacob has clearly been trained to be a deceiver by his parents back in chapter 27. The question is, is God on the side of the deception or not? Which is to say, is God on the side of the Israelites as they use deception to overcome their adversity against more physically powerful and imperially powerful opponents? And that's part of the bigger strategy here. So the dream uh, comes like this. During the mating of the flock, I once had a dream, although um, the word order is different here. In the Hebrew, I lifted up my eyes and saw a dream. Behold, in which the male goats had leaped upon the flock that were striped, speckled, and and mottled, um, which is a word to say in the act of mating here. Uh, Mottled being added here and only in verse 12 to the various forms of saying not Laban, not white. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am, much like Abraham did when the call came to offer Isaac and sacrifice, but also to Esau from his father Isaac and also to Jacob from Isaac. And then we see it from Joseph um, and Jacob later in the story. And so Jacob in the dream says, here I am. And the angel says, look up and see, or literally raise please your eyes and see. 
Um, the Septuagint and uh, John 4.35 have different verbs for lift up and see, but it's the same basic phrase when Jesus tells his disciples in Samaria to look up and see the fields ripe for the harvest and see the Samaritans coming. A similar image of fertility and prosperity for the mission at issue, although in a very different context, of course. But John 4 is certainly grounded in these stories as many scholars, including my own work in Becoming People of God, have highlighted the type scene at which Jacob meets the woman at Jacob's well. So it's not a coincidence that the look up and see here is parallel to the scene in John 4. But when he looks up, he doesn't see Samaritans. He sees goats leaping on the flock that are striped, speckled, and modded. And as the angel continues, I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. Um, much like, of course, that uh, Yahweh saw the suffering of the people in Sodom and much like Yahweh saw the suffering of the people in Egypt. So similarly sees that Jacob has been a victim of this suffering from the Mesopotamians and identifies God's self as I am Elohim of Bethel. And notice it started off with Yahweh appeared to me, then the angel of Elohim, and now I'm the Elohim of Bethel. We can read this as sources, as many scholars do, or we can read this as a final author who is basically telling us that Yahweh and Elohim are two names for the same God. And here, not the God of your father, but the God of Bethel, the very place that Jacob claimed in chapter 28, God was in this place and I didn't know it. And as we know, to the very place that King Josiah in the 620s or so made sure that nobody after him believed that Yahweh was in that place because he destroyed every evidence of that. So I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a pillar reminding us of that scene there back in chapter 28 and made a vow to me. We weren't sure whether God heard that vow because there was no response and now we know that's uh, response. So it's suggesting here that this God has been with him all along according to the dream report that he's giving uh, his women. And notice that we as readers are several steps removed. The author is telling us about something that Jacob had experienced um, in a dream by an angel who told him about the God who appeared. So it's several layers removed and yet that's how it comes to both Rachel and Leah and that's how it comes to us and we have to decide whether to trust that this is a true story or not that motivates them to side with him and not with their father and made a vow to me now leave this land at once although at once is not in the Hebrew or Greek and returned to the land of your birth framing with verse um, 3 and ending with not just uh, the land you came from but the land of your birth and that's very important because we'll see that in chapter 34 Jacob exhausted from the reunion with Esau settles before he gets back to the land of his birth and disaster ensues for not carrying out the um, the order directly and so now we've heard his argument what will the what will his wives do will they side with their father and the whole family they've been a part of or will they leave their family and go off with Jacob and their children to a new land we'll see what happens next time see you then bye bye